we're uh, staying with rugby or going back to rugby. Delighted to say we're joined on the line by the new president of Connacht Rugby, Anne Heenan. Good morning to you, Anne. Morning. Uh, congratulations on the job, first of all. The first thought that struck me was what does a president of a provincial um, club province uh, do? Um, that's a, a, a tough enough question to answer. I suppose you're the uh, you're the, the, the face, if you like, of of the province. So you get to uh, represent the province at at games, um, you, to attend all the official functions. In normal times, you would have gotten to travel with the team and represent Connacht home and abroad. But uh, with COVID at the moment, it's a bit of a, a fluid situation. So it's we have to wait and see how how things pan out. Yeah, they, it's they, well written about that. And the main reason that we've had you on because we wanted to mark the occasion of 135 years of Connacht Rugby and the first time that there's been a, um, a president at provincial level, I understand. Why is it taking this long, Anne, do you think? I don't know, really. I think there's possibly a perception out there that maybe, it, you know, it's more of a man's, a man's arena, especially at kind of administrative or at this level. Um, so maybe a, a little bit of reluctance for women to get involved, but hopefully this will now change things. You know, it, it is possible to to continue and to, to, to get to this type of level in the sport. Yeah, and like I know you talk about perception versus reality, but I was just having a look at the RFU management committee, for example, last night, a 25-person committee, two of which are women. What, what's your own take on that or the RFU's um promotion of women within the game whether it's on the pitch or off it i think there's been encouragement for women um to, to get involved but and like I, like i've said in different articles during the week positive discrimination is all very well but i don't want women to be involved you know at, at senior levels just because there, sh there should be a woman there um i think we, we need to err in the, the positions the same way as a man does you know, if there's a man and a woman going for the same position, I think it's the best person for the job that that should uh, should take up the role. Yeah, and I know that like you're very strong in yourself. That you've obviously worked up through the the grades to get the the gig on merit as well. So I mean, like that's that's a thing. But at the same time, when you when you look at that committee, for example, I mean, you look at all the key roles in it around the presidential lineup, and it's all very much. Um, male dominated, males of a of a certain vintage, I suppose, dominated. Like it is difficult when you see that. I think is it Mary Quinn and Sue Carty are the only two mm -hmm. females on that that entire committee. Like it is difficult to, when you talk about perception versus reality, to convey a message uh, to to women who are trying to come up through the ranks that this is an avenue that's available to you. When in reality, it's really not. I suppose it depends on the person, really. You know, if if you have enough interest in in what you're doing, enough interest in the sport, it it is possible. I mean, I haven't, I can't say I've faced any major challenges in getting getting to this position. Um, you know, I've just put in the years. You need to learn learn the background. You need to learn the ropes as you're coming through. Um, as I said, I'd hate just to have a woman parachuted into a position on the management committee of the RFU or another managerial position just because they, they want to improve the gender balance. Yeah, and we were chatting to... Sorry, go on. ...women to get involved. Yeah, is, is, do you see that part as your role? Or are you just very much focused on the Connacht side? Do you see it as a, you know, you you're, you're are going to help promote, for example, like the women's game and the promotion of um, women and girls into the game? I think uh, as a as a sport, I think women are already uh, women's rugby is is starting to get a lot more recognition. Uh, certainly in Connacht, we don't talk about men's rugby or women's rugby anymore. It's adult adult rugby and and underage rugby. So we've made that change ourselves. Um, I think for too long, women's rugby was kind of the poor the poor relation almost, um, and all the focus was on men's. But I think I think that is changing. You know, the women's game it's it's a great game to watch as well. And I think as it's opened up more and more to people, you know, as, as long as it's it's televised and, and people can can get to the games, I mean, at the, at the moment, it, that's not possible. But certainly television and, and radio has a big part to play in that. Yeah, and arguably that the national team have done more for the promotion of women's sport in this country than, than anything that's happened on or off the pitch um, over the last number of decades. And um, yeah. I suppose long, long may that continue. We were chatting to Andy Friend last week, and I don't know if it's an interview you've seen, but just about a range of things, actually, but um, including how hard it is to sort of hold on to the coattails, I suppose, of some of the... We've just been having a conversation with Alan Quinlan there previewing the weekend's 
um, Heineken Cup quarterfinals, and it's a difficult place for Connacht to um, find themselves in. But how do you hold on to the coattails of the richer cousins when you look at, look around at the richness of resources that exist around the other provinces? I think at, at this stage, you know, Connacht, Connacht are certainly holding their own. I mean, uh, you know, we, we earned our place in, in the Champions Cup last year. Um, the result might not have been what, what we what we particularly wanted, but we had we had a couple of good wins. Um, we always hold ourselves well on the pitch. I think it's a shame that COVID happened because we were just starting to come into our own at that stage. Um, the squad this season, we've got a good blend of experience and younger players who've come through from the academy as well. Um, and I think the thing about Connacht is that the whole grassroots to, to green shoots, um, it's all about nurturing, nurturing talent at local level and bringing those through. And I think we've got a, we've got a good balance and I'm looking forward to the, the season ahead when it kicks off. When you talk about those green shoots and nurturing that talent, and um, what do you mean? What structures have been put in place? There's a big encouragement. I, I suppose it started back with uh, with Pat Lamb when he came in as coach. And at the time, college might have been more focused, say, on Galway Mayo. But he included all of the provinces and made sure that every all of the counties realised that college rugby isn't just about Galway. You know, it's it's part for every every county in in Connacht. And he, I think, he developed the the fan base greatly for the time he was here. And that's encouraged lots of kids to get involved. You've got the players going out to the clubs, they're doing camps, um, they're doing, you know, skills displays, they're giving their time uh, to the clubs. And it, it just encourages people because you, you see a kid from a junior club in, you know, in Mayo and Sligo, uh, and suddenly they think, well, this guy from down the road has, has made it, he's on the Connacht senior squad, so why not me? Yeah, because like sometimes the idea of role models can be a little bit nebulous, or we can't actually see the exact mm -hmm. end product of it. But you've clearly made use of the role models by sending them out into the community, and there's clearly <laughs> going to be an upshoot from that. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's it's paying dividends as it is. Like you know, we have a we have a good balance of um, both Connacht and throughout Ireland on the team. So it's. I think it's certainly it's certainly paying off for us, and it, it fosters the the idea for fans as well because it's again you know it's, it's not just kids, but it's because Galway and Connacht is such a small place. You know you can walk down Shop Street and meet the players, and they'll stop for a chat, and um, people identify with them by name, and mm. it's it's much easier I think than in the other provinces. Uh, have you considered how uh, Connacht rugby taps into communities where? rugby has never really existed at all. You mentioned places in Connacht outside of Galway. I'm sure uh, the, the, the remote, more remote areas of Connacht probably have had a vice-like grip under the GEA for quite some time, and the GEA have done great things. Uh, how do you manage to tap into those communities? Well, we've had, there have been new clubs formed throughout throughout Connacht. You know, you've got Carrick and Shannon. Uh, even the other day, I was chatting to, to a guy from Clermorris, um, there would never have been a rugby club there. They've got a pitch. They've got, you know, they're starting their minis this weekend. So I think the whole success of Connacht, particularly if you go back to the to Pro 12 win, that encouraged all of the all of the province to get involved. I mean, there were huge huge crowds to welcome the team back. Um, everybody got invested in it at the time, and local communities started started up clubs, and that's that, that's certainly certainly helped and it's been a success. Because it, it definitely feels as well that there is a real identity uh, to Connacht at the moment. C certainly under Andy Friend, it was definitely the case under Pat Lamb as well, where you kind of knew the brand of rugby that Connacht were going to go out and play. I think they became everybody's second team for that Pro 12 uh, campaign. Uh, maybe that was maybe a bit of anti-Leinster bias with people going into that final, but uh, that was the case. Like That helps that on the pitch you have a brand of rugby that is really attractive and people around the province are like, all of a sudden, I want to watch that game and I want to watch this sport. I think so. I mean, Connacht are playing a very exciting game at the moment. You know, it's it's mm. fast moving, it's skillful. It's a joy to watch. It's it, it's like, you know, it's like like what we should be, really. Yeah, for sure. Like, how do you then build on that? What What is the, the next step? Because I, I know uh, Andy was talking about, hopefully, the, the development of, a, of new facilities and with the right mm. people in tow as well, you can really take this thing to the next level. 
That's right. I mean, before before the whole lockdown, I mean, we, we, we had got the funding for the new the development of the sports ground. Uh, we have got planning permission. Everything is pretty much in place when it's safe to move forward with that. And I think the decision to stay in the sports ground has been a, has been a great one. Um, the fact that we've got a stadium in the centre of the city where you can walk down into Air Square, you can you can wander into town. I think that's a huge bonus. Um, I think any of the any of the clubs that have a have their facilities close to the city, you, you certainly see the difference. And that feeds back then into the, the lifeblood of the city as well. I mean, when, when there's a, a big match in, in Connacht, you know, Galway's alive for the couple of days beforehand. And for that weekend, you know, you've got all the visiting supporters. And again, you know, it's, it, we're a small city. You know, you have your supporters wandering around town in their in their supporters gear and everyone is welcoming them. And it's just, I think it's just, we, we've, we're lucky. We've got a, we've got a good setup. We've got a great fan base, and uh, everything just uh, just just seems to, at the moment, seems to work for us. So just looking forward, as I say, to getting back into the new season and hopefully being able to get fans back into the sports ground again at some point. Yeah, how important is that? Because uh, I guess it's, it's such a, a social event. It, it is the, the the lifeblood of every sports organisation. But is it almost like a, a ticking clock in your head at the moment that fans need to get back in ASAP? Not really. I think everybody understands the current situation, and the last thing anybody wants to do is put players uh, in jeopardy. I mean, they're they're professionals at the moment. They're they're all in a, in their own little bubble, you know, as a team. They're tested regularly, and that's the most important thing. Their health at the moment. It's great to see see games, being able to just watch live games again on TV, is a huge bonus. Um, I think the fans are always going to be there. We're just just happy to be able to. To watch sport again um, and hopefully you know as things start to, to open up we can get back there but only when it's safe for everybody to do that uh, just one last one for me the, the there's a story in one of the papers this morning about the irfu i think were to take a hit of they projected around 20 million and obviously in the nature of these things and the unpredictable nature of where we're at at the minute that period has been mm -hmm. extended and now they're looking at potentially and i know philip brown is before the doll COVID committee today the special committee to <laughs> give an update on the state of finance and they're talking now about estimates in the region of 30 million quid and mm -hmm. um i don't know if it's overstating it to say that there's um an existential threat to professional rugby in Ireland now. What's your view of that? I mean, there's a huge loss of revenue, uh, and that's the that's that's the mainstay of, of the budgets. Um, obviously, the IRFU have been have been working on this, like the like the GA, like soccer have over the last couple of months, and trying to to you know all of the the professionals, the the, the administrative staff, everybody is taking pay cuts. Everyone is trying to do the best that they can. The, the gates are a huge loss. I mean, you're, yeah. that's that's where your your revenue is generated. Um, but I think the you know the RFU like the others are being sensible. They're looking at their budgets. They're they're planning ahead. They're planning for the possibility that there may be no gates, and um, we just have to have to wait and see what see what happens. Um, hopefully, you know. I mean, I, I can't see professional rugby coming to an end, but um, we certainly need need the injection of, of revenue, but again, health and, and everybody's safety is, is the priority. Can can Irish professional rugby, can Connacht rugby see see that through without the gates for what could be, I mean, it could be another 12 months, it could be anything, we, we're really not sure, but um, in terms of the finances, is that something that Connacht rugby can ride out? Again, we've, we've got a great board, we've got great financial people in place there. And um, you know they've 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 planned for these possibilities. Um, as I said, Connachter Connachter in a good place. Hopefully, we're you know we're not looking at uh, not having gates for for a, a long period of time. But we've planned for the, for that possibility, and uh, we, we you know we can we can deal with that. But uh, let's let's hope that every, every every you know people get a handle on on COVID and how to deal with it in sport and and how to let spectators back in. But as I say, no, we're, we're in a good place in Connacht and uh, we've certainly plans plans in place for, for any eventuality. And at the moment, it's just a day-by-day -day basis as we see how, how things work around the country. Yeah, well, look, that strikes something of a positive note, which is a good place to leave it. Well, well done and congratulations on the, on the job and best of luck with the tenure. Anna Heenan, thanks, thanks for, for taking the call. Thanks, thanks, thanks for talking to me.
the new uh, Connacht president, and uh, we shall watch that with interest. As I said, Philip Brown and his counterparts from uh, the GEA and the FAI are before the Dáil uh, Committee today, the Special Covid Committee, to uh, discuss all things uh, finances. We'll see how that pans out over the next little